So we've seen that active weighting is not the best idea to do it. You can do it, you can get functional solutions, but of course we always want to try to achieve a better solution here. So let's look for even better alternatives. And if we have active weighting as a not so great solution, we can consider another approach, which we call passive weighting here. So the idea behind passive weighting is that a process no longer just continues to run through its loop, checking again and again for the condition that the critical section becomes free, but that a process actually releases the CPU while they wait for an event. So if they want to run an acquire function and they figure out, okay, this critical section is just in use, they know it doesn't make much sense to continue just going through its active waiting loop over and over again. But we should do something similar to waiting for an I.O. request. So process, in the case synchronization is required, should actually block itself. So remove itself from the CPU while waiting for an event and then can get the CPU again whenever this critical section is free again. So now we have to enter this process into a waiting queue. So we need to indicate that this process that has just blocked itself is waiting for an event, so for a certain critical section to become free, because otherwise we'd have to go again through all of our processes to check if any of them was waiting, which is very inefficient, as we've already seen in the bakery algorithm. So when the event occurs, then a problem that can happen is obviously that not only one process was waiting for the critical section to become free, but a number of processes we're waiting to become free, uh, for the critical section to, to become free. So only one of the processes in the waiting list should be allowed to be unblocked because that one is the next one entering the critical section. If we unblocked multiple processes, then we'd have the same problem as before. Then we just have multiple processes then thinking the critical section is theirs, trying to enter the critical section. So we need this waiting queue in order to creates some sort of order again for processes to access a critical section. And this waiting phase of a process, as I said, is realized similar to an IO access uh, as a blocking phase, which for IO we've called an IO burst. So uh, when this happens, the process schedule is updated. So another process can use the CPU. Another of these processes in state ready will be selected by the OS and then moved to the running state, whereas the process that just was unsuccessfully trying to enter the critical section needs to wait. It is blocked until, well, this critical section is unblocked sometime in the future. Here's an interesting question, and I'm not going to discuss the details, something just for you to think about. Uh, what happens if all the processes are just blocked at a given moment? That can happen. So what happens if no process is in the ready state at that moment? What can the operating system do? There's nothing to run on the CPU. Is this a problem? And if yes, what can you do against this? Maybe think about this. Oh, I'd be interested if you found a solution to this. And of course, then when the process blocks itself, so it does passive waiting, its CPU burst ends, so it's taken off the CPU and it just starts to wait passively. So the operating system actually handles waiting for this process because the operating system is a thing that's notified when a critical section is left and then it can check if any of the processes uh, have been waiting for this critical section and can wake up these processes so they can continue to run. So how can we implement something like this? One very common way to implement this is by using a construct called a semaphore. So a semaphore is defined as a non-negative integer number and a semaphore can have two atomic operations. So the name of these operations are derived from uh, something Dijkstra invented. So one of the famous Dutch computer scientists. And unfortunately in the first paper, so I looked at the first papers of semaphores, they were actually written in Dutch. So he actually used Dutch terms to uh, just name the operations that you can perform on a semaphore. So there's two operations. The one is called P from the Dutch word prolach, which uh, means to decrement. Uh, in other contexts, this is also just called down or weight. So uh, if you call P on a semaphore, uh, the P operation first checks the value of the semaphore. If the semaphore has the value zero, 
This indicates, okay, the resource well belonging to that sum4 is already in use. So the process calling this p function is blocked. So it has to wait until, well, the sum4 is free again. Otherwise, the p function just decrements this non-negative integer value of the sum4 and continues to run. So we can enter the critical section because a value larger than zero indicates, yes, the sum4 indicated that this critical section was free. And the uh, mirror uh, operation to this to uh, and uh, to leave a critical section again is called v from the Dutch word for hoch, which means increment. Uh, it's also called up or signal. So uh, if a function, uh, if a process leaving a critical section calls v, then a process waiting for the semaphore because it has called p before and is blocked. That process, one of the processes, is then unblocked. And if nothing had been waiting for that sem uh, semaphore, then the semaphore is just incremented by one, just indicating it's free again. So uh, semaphores are an abstraction uh, that is provided by the operating system. And this abstraction can be used to exchange synchronization signals between concurrently running processes. So here is an example for an implementation of a semaphore. So this is taken from a teaching operating system in use in Germany called OSTOPS. And this is written in this case in C++, but it should be relatively easy to understand. So our semaphore is derived from a class waiting room. So waiting room is just a list of processes with some access methods NQ and DQ. So essentially just a waiting list of processes where you can add processes and remove processes again. Our semaphore has a local variable counter and it has two methods here. So essentially a wait method, so our p method and a signal method, our v method here again. And uh, what it does is, as we've just described on the previous slide, so wait checks if the counter belonging to our variable is equal to zero. Then if this counter is equal to zero, we're not allowed to enter the critical section. So uh, we're getting the active scheduler and NQ, the, our current process here, into this waiting queue of the scheduler. And then tells the scheduler, please block the current process for exactly this event. If the counter was larger than zero, well, we just decrement it and leave our wait method here so we can enter the critical section. So wait uh, actually now interacts with the operating system here with the scheduler to change the order of processes. So to indicate the current process, please block this dear operating system and get another one to continue running. So for semaphores now the operation to leave a critical section, so here in our case V or signal, gets a bit more complicated because now we have to ensure that if there is another process in our waiting room for the semaphore, it needs to be woken up. So it takes one of the elements from our queue. And if there was one in our queue, so if this pointer here that's returned is not equal to zero, so there's a valid element in our queue, then it again interacts with our operating system scheduler and wakes this new process up. So this new process can then continue to try to enter this critical section. And if this is not the case, so if no, no other process was actually waiting for our semaphore, we just increment the counter again. So a future uh, wait operation can then just check for the counter value and enter the critical section again. So we see uh, that we now need to interact with our scheduler here and our scheduler provides three critical operations. So active returns the uh, process control block. So essentially a reference to the running process. Block moves a process into the state blocked and wake up puts one of the blocked processes that we retrieved here back on the ready list so it can be scheduled uh, so it is no longer blocked. So how do we use semaphores now? Well, let's first take a look at a very simple use case of semaphores, which just 
yeah, more or less emulates log variables, but without active weighting. So this is called mutual exclusion. So uh, this is a special case of a semaphore, which is initialized to either zero or one. So a semaphore, which we initialize to one, just functions as a, so uh, as a log variable here. So now we have our semaphore here and we create an instance of the semaphore called log. And uh, now uh, we have our nq function again. And this looks very similar to our use case uh, of the log we've seen before when we discussed active weighting. So again, we have our three functions here, uh, our three lines of code in nq that manipulate our linked list here. And now before the start of our critical section, now we call wait and pass the log we just instantiated here as a parameter. And after we leave our critical section, now we call signal on the same log to indicate that we've finished our critical section. So if we are the first process to enter the critical section, our log is in, in, uh, initialized to one, then, well, we can enter the critical section and the value of log is decremented to zero. So all the others coming after us have to wait and while they, while they have to wait, they are blocked, so they don't use valuable CPU time. And when leaving the critical section, then we call signal. And depending on if there was another process waiting in between, then this process is woken up. We don't change the value of our lock because then we immediately let it continue in that critical section here. So we don't need to change the value. It still indicates that it's locked just for another process. And if no other process was waiting, signal just increments our log value to one again to indicate, yeah, please now try to enter this critical section. This is a very simple application of semaphores. Now, the nice thing about semaphores is that they are pretty versatile. So we can do quite a number of additional things uh, instead of just locking a single critical section with this. So. Here's some simple interactions with semaphores. So the first one is what we call one-sided synchronization. So here we have a scenario where we have two processes that have different functionality. The first process is a so-called producer. So this generates some data elements, or for example, it just provides keys read from the keyboard. And uh, this can enqueue elements in a queue. And then there's another process that takes out elements from that queue again and does something with them. For example, if this would be keys from the keyboard here in our producer, our consumer could take these key presses one after the other and output the related characters on your screen. So a problem that you have here is that the producer and consumer are separate processes, so they run in parallel. So what can happen is that uh, without our signal and wait semaphore operations here, our consumer could just start first and it could try to read something from our queue and there's nothing in it because uh, no producer has put something in the queue so far. So that would be a problem. And what we would ideally want to achieve is that we would have some synchronization. So as long as no element is in our queue, our consumer waits for the producer to put an element in the queue. And whenever a producer has put an element in the queue, it sends a signal to our consumer that now there's an element available. So essentially the consumer can continue, read the next element from our queue. And that's exactly what happens here. So we have our shared semaphore in both processes. So this must be two threads having a single shared data uh, segment or two processes with shared memory. So we see we have the same address of memory. So it's the same variable here. So the pro producer only calls one operation, the signal operation to indicate there's one more and the consumer decrements this and it blocks when there are no elements remaining to be read until a producer then actually yeah, decides to create another element and put it in the queue. So we initialize our semaphore to zero because initially our queue is empty. And what we need for this is our list and element as we've seen before. And we need a single semaphore element here. Now, what you could also do with semaphores is so-called resource-oriented synchronization. For example, you can have resources 
where you have multiple instances and it doesn't really matter which of the instances you are uh, allocated as long as there's still one available. So one example would just be you are trying to print something and you have like five printers connected to your computer and it doesn't matter uh, which printer actually prints your document as long as it's printed in one piece and undisturbed. So here you can do something uh, with semaphores uh, that makes use of the fact that the semaphore is actually an integer value. So it's not only 0 or 1, but it can actually count. And what you do when uh, you use these uh, signal and weight or P and V operations is you count this value down to 0 and you count it up from 0 again. And there's no restriction of just going to 1. So with resource-oriented synchronization, you can actually also administer a set of identical resources here and you do this by initializing the semaphore which we call resource here to n instead of 1 and the rest works very similar as the code on the previous slide with mutual exclusion. Here just we have several processes that can enter this critical section at the same time just considering that each of these critical sections then accesses one of these classes of resources so we don't have any interference between the parallel running processes. So, of course, if we have simple interactions with semaphores, we can also have complex interactions with semaphores. And one example for this is the first so-called reader-writer problem. So as you can imagine, there's not only a first, but there's more of these. There's also a second reader-writer problem with a bit of a different scenario. So uh, in this example, as with mutual exclusion, we also have to protect a critical section. But a bit similar to our previous simple example one, uh, we have two classes of concurrent processes now. So again, we have different functionality between the processes. So we have a set of writers, so one or more processes that write data. So these change data in a joint data structure and need a guarantee for mutual exclusion. And then we can have more, one or more processes that are readers. So they just read data from this yeah, shared data structure that is common with the writers. Uh, so multiple readers should be allowed to enter the critical section at the same time. So this is an implementation of the first reader-writer problem using semaphores. So we have a shared memory with two semaphores now, one semaphore called mutex and the other called wrt for writer. And we have a variable uh, for our read count. So we initialize both our mutex and our writer to one and our read count to zero. Now here's our code for our writer processes. So all writer processes are similar. And because writer processes should not be able to interfere with other writer processes. These writer processes actually use the semaphore WRT to synchronize between yeah, themselves and the other writer processes here. So they wait for the WRT semaphore that they can write data. And finally, they can signal using the WRT semaphore that yeah, essentially another writer can write. So what does the reader look like? Well, the reader uses a read count. So this is initially uh, zero as we've seen. So what we do here, we increment the read count. And if we have a reader here, then we wait for a writer to write something. And after we've read data, we decrement the read count again. And if there is no reader again, then we signal our write semaphore here so uh, a writer can start again. So why do we use this additional mutex here? Now, essentially because here again, we have a critical section between read count plus plus and checking the value of read count. Again, some process scheduling can take place, some interrupts can take place. So we'd have an inconsistency here. So this mutex here is actually used to synchronize different readers manipulating the read count value so essentially we need this additional mutex here and here. So we need to acquire it here and release it here. And of course the same when we decrement our read count again. So this ensures on the one hand that our read count is incremented deterministically. And on the other hand, it uh, just uh, realizes that, well, as long as uh, we have readers here, then our writers have to wait.
So semaphores are very versatile and there are many more uses of semaphores and extensions and variants of this. So we've already seen this binary semaphore or mutex, uh, which can be used as a lock variable. We can also have non-blocking weights if we, for example, know that the wait time is very low so that a block and reschedule and unblock would take much longer than just waiting for a short amount of time. We can have semaphores with timeouts. Uh, so a timeout uh, means that you can only want to wait for uh, acquiring a semaphore for a certain time and then maybe do something else or fail. And you can also have arrays of counters uh, to make your semaphores even more complex. Now, there are a number of sources of errors that can show up when you use semaphores. The biggest source of errors is that you can actually have a situation that is called a deadlock. We'll talk about this in our next lecture. Uh, semaphores are more difficult to implement and uh, when you want more complex synchronization patterns, as we've seen before with the first reader-writer problem, again, you already have two semaphores that have to interact and you have to get this exactly right so uh, your synchronization works. Uh, the incorporating processes depend on each other, so all of them must use the semaphores in exactly the same way. So if one of the processes has a bug or does something intentionally wrong, then you have a problem. And uh, well, the use of semaphores for entering a critical section is not enforced by the operating system. So essentially, when you try to enter a critical section without just uh, calling a P or wait operation on the semaphore, nobody hinders you to do this. But then, of course, you will run the risk of having inconsistent data again. And as we've already said, bugs like these are pretty hard to find. So uh, another idea would be can we have something like support in programming languages for synchronization? Support for synchronization in programming languages has also been already discussed in the 1970s and maybe earlier. And this support for programming language synchronization constructs is called a monitor. So a monitor again is another abstract data type and this has two implicit synchronization properties. So the first thing is there's multilateral synchronization at the interface to the monitor. Uh, so essentially this means that there's mutual exclusion of the execution of all monitor methods when you try to do something with it. And there's unilateral synchronization inside of the monitor using condition variables. So inside of the monitor you have something similar to semaphores. You have a wait function which blocks the process until the signal or condition occurs and uh, implicitly then this wait function releases the monitor again so some other process can use this monitor and you have a signal function that indicates that a signal or condition has occurred and this can unblock either exactly one selected or maybe all processes that were blocking on this event and this monitor concept was provided in a number of languages some of these are pretty old like concurrent pascal uh, which uh, was uh, already invented by uh, Per Brinch Hansen in Copenhagen uh, in the 1970s. Uh, other systems programming languages like PL1, Chill, but also Java implements something like the monitor concept. So here's some example code for a monitor. Careful again, this is pseudocode that doesn't compile right away. And here we want to uh, implement a synchronized queue. So this is a synchronized queue, that's a type of monitor. This has a queue and a condition that indicates it's not empty. So again, you see this is, uh, well, C++ style pseudocode. And this has two methods. So an NQ method that takes a new element that enqueues something to our queue and signals this queue is no longer empty here. And a DQ function that well, tries to take an element out of our synchronized queue. So, uh, well, while this queue is empty, we can't take an element out of this. So we have to wait for a condition that it's not empty. And as we've seen, wait is something blocking, so we can be descheduled here. And if we're out of this, because this is a while loop here with this non-empty wait call inside of the while loop, only if this queue is no longer empty, then we can dequeue something, we can take something out of the queue and return this value. So here, the language actually guarantees the mutual exclusion of the access methods per object 
sync queue here. So essentially, uh, there's a mechanism behind all this because we derived this from a monitor to ensure this mutual exclusion to the access methods here. So NQ signals that the queue is no longer empty. If no process is waiting, nothing is happen happening. If a process is waiting, we signal this here. Then this signal is passed down here to anyone trying a DQ. And then uh, essentially this queue is empty condition no longer holds and we can get something out of our queue again using the monitor abstraction. So how does signaling work in monitors? So in the case that we have waiting processes, a monitor has to fulfill the following two requirements. So first it needs to ensure that at least one of the processes waiting for the condition variable is deblocked. And in addition, it also has to ensure that at most one process continues to run after the monitor operation. Because if two processes or more would continue to run, we again had the problem of multiple processes yeah, executing in the same critical section. There are different solution approaches to these uh, problems. Each of these uh, approaches has its own semantics here. So uh, we can differentiate these approaches between the number of processes that are activated. So are all processes activated when something is signaled, so a condition is signaled, or is only one process actually uh, activated? And if it's only one, which of the processes should we choose? And this choice of the monitor might interfere with a scheduling choice of the operating system. So maybe we have a conflict with CPU allocation of our scheduler here. And the other question is who owns this monitor? So is there a change of the monitor that takes place or is there no change that takes place? So if no immediate change of the owner of that monitor takes place, then we need to check this waiting condition over again. As I've said, we not only have monitors in old programming languages from the 1970s, but also in a bit more modern languages like Java, even though Java is also several decades old by now. So in Java, you have a keyword called synchronized. And this synchronized keyword indicates to the virtual Java machine running below uh, our Java code that you want mutual exclusion to happen. So uh, for Java monitors, you have one implicit condition variable and instead of a signal method, you have a notify or notify all method. And in Java monitors, no change of owner takes place. So this is what the synchronized queue would look like in Java. So here you have a class sync queue, which has a private variable queue here. And now we have our two functions here, nq and dq. And you see these have the keyword synchronized added. So this means that there's internally a monitor function working for this. And whenever you NQ an element, well, you call the NQ function to your queue, and then you notify all, so you notify all waiting processes. And when you want to remove an element, then you have a wait loop. It's uh, here again, uh, calling wait as long as the queue is empty. And as soon as we know the queue is no longer empty, we can DQ an element. And because these methods here are synchronized, uh, the case that one process is running in that function here and the other one is running in that one cannot occur because the monitor takes care of this. So to conclude today's lecture, we've seen that uncontrolled concurrent data access can lead to errors. And we need synchronization methods to provide coordination between these parallel data accesses. And uh, when you implement synchronization methods, you have to be careful uh, because you need to ensure that the selection strategy, so which process comes next, if you have something like this, do not uh, stand in conflict with decisions the operating system scheduler wants to take. And we've seen a very simple ad hoc approaches, active waiting. We've seen a first example of uh, yeah, an incorrect solution. And then we've seen uh, different approaches to correct solutions. But still, you have to take care because active waiting is in most cases pretty much just a waste of compute time. But there might be cases where a short active wait is better than blocking, especially if you have multiprocessor systems. But we'll talk a bit uh, more about this in our lecture on multiprocessor operating systems. The operating system supported approach for passive waiting then is semaphores.
So this is very flexible. So it enables many different synchronization patterns and we've seen some of those, but it's error prone. So you have to get it right. And on the other hand, you can uh, provide language supported approaches, monitors, of course, then all of your uh, processes just using these uh, monitors to synchronize uh, between themselves have to be written in the same language, obviously, or in the same process, even depending on your compiler. This is less versatile compared to semaphores. It's expensive since using monitors requires many context switches, but monitors are in turn a very safe approach. So what you're actually ending up to, uh, using in your own operating system when you're going to design and implement one, this is up to you and this depends on your use case. So as always, we'll uh, end this lecture with a set of references to the literature. And here you see that all of the problems we've been talking about were already discussed in the 1970s. So the uh, first thing is the bakery algorithm, which was proposed by Leslie Lampert. Uh, maybe you've heard that name before. This is also the guy behind the latex macro set for the uh, text uh, setting system of Donald Knuth. Uh, there's a nice little book on semaphores, Alan B. Downey, which contains much more information about semaphores than you ever wanted to know. The uh, concurrent Pascal and uh, monitor concept was uh, discussed by Per Hansen uh, already in 1973. So you see all these concepts tried to cope with the situation that you have more computing power, you could support parallel processes and different researchers all over the world tried different approaches to solve this. So this uh, is a chapter from his operating system principles book from 1973. Uh, monitors were uh, also described by uh, Tony Hoare, Sir Tony Hoare uh, in 1974. So that was a parallel development, but I think they were communicating about this problem even back then. So monitors as an operating system structural concept uh, was his publication. And if you want to know more about Concurrent Pascal, which was a language which was a favorite in academic circles for implementing operating system uh, related code in the 1970s, you can read uh, a paper on this by Per Prinschansen, again, also from 1975. So that's all for today. In our next lecture, we take a look at the problems showing up when synchronizing things. So it's not just simple and easy when you got, for example, semaphores running, there can still be problems. Uh, we can have so-called deadlocks and we'll see what this is next time. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Bye.